Welcome back. Gospel in class continues. Today, um, I want to put a caveat at the beginning of the class. We're talking about stuff that is obviously Christian in nature. But today, we are not talking about anything that goes to dogma or creed. We're going to Christian tradition. And if you think it's a bunch of junk, that's fine. If you think this is stupid, that's fine. You, can, you will not be branded a heretic. Um, it, the language of Christian art is a way to communicate certain things in the art. And certain things in the art mean something. Maybe it's a stupid thing that it means in your mind, which is fine. And I, I will respect that. But other Christians all over the world take it to mean something. And if you think that you, when you walk into a building that has a big cross, you're not thinking of some kind of modern art. You're thinking Jesus on a cross. You see it. You think that. You see uh, a thing that could be feeding animals in a, in a primitive farm. You're not thinking about the animals eating. You're thinking about Jesus. That kind of symbolism, boom, you're right there. I say this because on the cover of Gospel and Glass, you see that little wheat thing over there, which is a symbol that means an awful lot to people here at Beverly Heights. The wheat gathered and scattered. Do you see it there on the Gospel and Glass and then the wheat? Um, it, that symbol is all over the paperwork, any paper printed here. Uh, we see it everywhere. But it doesn't mean anything, really, except to Beverly Heights people. And it's not really about wheat. We're not thinking about making bread. We're not thinking about famine or how much rainfall. We're thinking of a congregation gathered and scattered. That kind of symbolism. Be cool if that became a wider spread symbol. Maybe it will. There were, um, from last week, Nancy Sykes had a question. She said, that window in the chapel, this is the go ye into all the world Great Commission window. Mm -hmm. And there's Jesus, it could be also called Ascension. It's one of the last things he said before he ascended into heaven. I think this is out of Mark. And you see Jesus there. This over on the right side is the bottom part of the window. Nancy's question is these creatures, these things, these designs, here. There's three of them. I don't know what they are. Any, any ideas? Curious. I'm going to be asking the folks at Hunt Stained Glass Studios about that. They put these windows in in 1957, and probably whoever knew for sure is not there. But uh, maybe somewhere in the lore of, the comp of their company, they would have an idea. To me, they almost look like bodies, like yeah. dead bodies. Right. But maybe they don't have feet? They don't. Yeah, they look almost mummified. Well, because I see feet on Jesus. Mm. Toes? Toes. Interesting. But the other ones, I don't see feet on. I'm just making an observation. Maybe they're the lost. Pardon? Maybe they're the lost. That's they are the lost. Maybe they're dead to the world. I, I don't know. Well, that was one of my thoughts was spiritually dead and where to go to those spiritually dead things. But it's. Do they look like they're encased in, in, in a tomb? Yeah. Um, or Jesus doesn't have that. Right. Basement. I did ask H.B. Mertz, who's got a long experience in Christian symbolism and glass, and he had never seen anything like this either. And he says, no, you have to talk to Hunt. But then he did come back, so obviously he was thinking about this. And he says, you know, there are three of them, and how long was Jesus in the tomb? It could be symbolic of Jesus' own death. I don't know. Interesting. The other thing from last, I hope we have a continuing saga on this with like more information. It's interesting. Um, I had mentioned Im imperfections in glass that good stained glass is not perfect. It's got little bubbles in it. It's different thicknesses. It's bumpy. 
the dye is not evenly distributed. All those things that are wrong with it are what makes it right. And it really livens up the window. Now, I hate to pick on our friends up at Ingemar Methodist, but this is from Ingemar Methodist up in North Hills. This is her chancel window. You can see it's right in the front. And the, the glass is perfect. And it doesn't sparkle. There's nothing wrong with this, but there's no life in my mind. It's not fair to pick on them, but I will pick on them because it's such a good example. Okay. okay. Today, um, we're talking about symbolism. And the first thing I'd like you to do is to think of the year you were born and then subtract 100. And we're going to think about the things that happened in that 100 years before your birth. I was born before 1960, so when I do that, my 100 years includes the Lincoln presidency, the Civil War. For a lot of us, it includes a lot of wars. Um, in my case, it includes the symphonies of Johannes Brahms and all the work of George Gershwin. It includes the thought that led up to the League of Nations, the thought that led up to the United Nations, NATO, a lot of wars, a lot of political scandals, a lot of dead presidents. The point is, the 100 years before you were born, a lot of stuff happened. It's not static. We're not even thinking here of the technological things, um, aviation, cars, the wiring of houses, phones. Um, Electricity. It's a dynamic thing. 100 years, even in the ancient times, had stuff happening. I mention this because of this guy named Irenaeus. You look up something up on the internet three times and you get three different answers. Irenaeus, Irenaeus, Irenaeus. You can find somebody to support all of those. He was born in 130 in Izmir, Turkey, which is where Andrew Brunson was doing his work. Subtract 100 years from his birth and you are within shouting distance of the date of Jesus' death and resurrection. So his 100 years includes everything since the resurrection, a lot of stuff. It wasn't a static time. He died in 202. He was, at that time, a bishop of the church. The church wasn't official, so it wasn't quite the big political prestige job that a bishop might be, might, might think of as a bishop. He was possibly martyred. Now, he had a claim to fame, well, two claims to fame. Number one, he was born into a Christian family, and he was a good scholar. He knew he could read. He read everything. He could digest what he read. He could sift through it. And in those hundred years, he had a lot of things to read. At that point, the, there was no such thing as a New Testament. The New Testament would not come until the late 300s, although they did know what books had been written, what reports had been written, what letters had been written. We're familiar with a lot of them, but we are not familiar with all of them because they decided that some of them just didn't make the cut. And Irenaeus, Irenaeus was one of the people who could really sift through this and start to understand what, what was good. His other claim to fame is sort of like the Kevin Bacon game, Six Degrees of Separation. He had one degree of separation. He was associated with this guy named Polycarp, 69, who's was also after the Jesus resurrection, who was also martyred. But Polycarp was a good buddy of John the disciple, John that wrote Revelation, John the disciple that Jesus loved. So Irenaeus running around with Polycarp, he's pretty close to a disciple. And he probably has all kinds of inside information from Polycarp. He counts, especially in the ancient world, when knowledge is not quite like we've got it in our libraries and archives and reports and newspapers and everything else. If you had this kind of degree of separation, that counts a lot. He wrote a book called Against Heresies. He looked at all the books on his desk. Some of them didn't make any sense. And he recognized that some of them were very good and some of them were very bad. Um, it's an attack. I'll read this because there's just no way to, to paraphrase this. His book, 
against heresies was an attack on Gnosticism. He wanted to counter the doctrines of the Gnostic sects claiming secret wisdom. wisdom. He offered three pillars of orthodoxy, the scriptures, which in that case were the Old Testament scriptures, the tradition handed down by the apostles, <clears throat> and the teaching of the apostles' successors. Intrinsic to his writing is that the surest source of Christian guidance is the Church of Rome. You can see that coming through in history. And he is the earliest surviving witness to regard all four of the Gospels as essential. Uh, one of his books was consists of Jesus sayings where he stressed the unity of the Old Testament and the Gospel. In the final volume, he's focused on the sayings of Jesus and the letters of Paul the Apostle. Um, I want to read something from Ezekiel, and we are going to get to our Christian symbolism in a minute. We're running pretty far afield, but we'll get there. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. <clears throat> He's talking about four living creatures in a vision. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man in front. <clears throat> the four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle at the back. A lion, an ox, an eagle, and a man. Then you go to Revelation, which in Irenaeus is book would be it would be very familiar to him revelation 4 verse 7 and again in john's vision and around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind the first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox the third living creature with the face of a man and the, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle the same man, ox, lion, eagle kind of thing. Then he looked at the books on his desk, and he could look at the stack of reports from the previous hundred years, and he realized that four of them really fit that. And so we have the face of a, a winged man thinking of those four books, which guess what? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe these ideas relate to those Gospels. A winged lion, winged ox, and obviously an eagle with a lot of wings. When the church was built originally, and it ended where the side aisles end, before the transepts, that's where the wall was. It was a very plain wall. In 1950s, they pushed that wall back about 30 feet, and they put a bunch of wood on the back wall of that. And if you look carefully, you see these four wood carvings on that wall. There are two up high, and there are two down at foot level, but they're right in the middle. And I had always wondered why we didn't have more. It was stupid to put two of them down, down low. And why did they limit themselves to four? Because there's a whole bunch of wood there. No, just four. But the original church sanctuary had the pulpit smack dab in the middle, which is a very reformed Protestant kind of thing. The preaching of the gospel is central. And the pulpit is central. But there's also a way of thinking where you have the lectern on one side and the pulpit on the other. And that's what they did in 1953 separated the two. Now we've got the pulpit on one side and the piano on the other side. Not quite so symbolic, but it's OK. But the point is, these four things are dead center as you look up, up at the front of the church. The Gospels are central. And I really like that. It's too bad that those two are down low. It used to be that the floor of the chancel was lower, so they were visible. But if you go into the choir loft, you can move the chairs, take a look, and realize that when you're looking at that, you're not just seeing cool things like a man with wings, a lion with wings, an ox with wings, and an eagle. Now these, they, Irenaeus, Irenaeus did um, assign one of these to each of the Gospels. And this is starting to get to be where we 
think these are the four Gospels. There might have been 20 Gospels, but these four together are needed. And I'll read this directly too. And, and this is again from his book Against Heresies where he talks about this. The quote, John tells of his original, effectual, and glorious generation from the Father. This would be the eagle. Declaring, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And also all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. This is why John's gospel is full of confidence, for that is who he was. Then Luke, who he would match up with the ox. Luke focuses on his priestly character. He begins his gospel with Zechariah the priest offering sacrifice to God. For now the fatted calf is ready and will be sacrificed in order to bring the younger son home. Matthew would be tied to the winged man. For his part, Matthew declares his generation as a man, beginning his gospel with an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. His is the gospel of humanity, for which reason it is, too, that a humble and meek man is kept up through the whole gospel. Now Mark, who would be the lion, begins with a prophetical spirit coming down from on high to people. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Pretty cool. Some people reverse them. Uh, Irenaeus is putting the winged lion with Mark. He would assign Jerome and other early Christian fathers would say that's John. And they would say that the eagle is Mark. But it's very traditional. And what has come down in most tradition is that Mark gets the lion. Interesting. Um, can I tell a story? <laughs> um, Jack got to read, lucky guy, got to read some of my early drafts of Gospel and Glass. And I would, a lot of stuff in there I hadn't been chattering about. And in this part in particular I found very interesting, but I hadn't really mentioned it to him. So he's reading this and he's saying, wow, whoa, really? By gosh, at the next choir practice, there's this hubbub in the back row of men, and they're saying, Jeff's saying, do you ever know who this was here? Look at this. Oh, slide. And all the men are in the tenors and the basses figuring what they've been standing in front of for decades. It was sort of fun. Um, I like that they still have the Gospels front and center, regardless. Um, the Book of Kells was written in 800. It's one of those beautiful illuminated manuscripts from Ireland. Um, they have a page in there called The Four Evangelists. And I think Nancy would be hard pressed to figure out how this works too, these creatures. But it is a winged man, a winged lion, an ox, and an eagle. Right there in, in a very ancient manuscript. Comments? Questions? I told you we'd get to that part. We'll also talk about today the Christian symbol windows. These are along the side aisles, three on each aisle. They're original. It's that very plain, simple, direct kind of art. I have tried to find symbolism in the lower parts of the window and can't. So I'm convinced that Pittsburgh stained glass wanted a calming window, not distracting, not glaring, and that's what they've got on these two lower parts. Now that piece up at the top, in the triangle kind of shape piece, is called a kite in stained glass because it's sort of flying above the whole window. And that's where they put Christian symbols. And these are so obvious, there's hardly anything to say about it, a cross and a crown. This one in the paperwork from Pittsburgh St. Glass is called it ascending dove, descending dove, but it's still a dove, and the rays behind it. I think the bottom, if you really go upstairs and look at the windows all along, you'll find 
changes in the coloring of these lower parts, but nothing to distract you. Ten Commandments. A rope and an anchor. And with an anchor, you don't drift far from where you need to be. Maybe not one of those more familiar Christian symbols, but it also goes back to the, what should we say, the, the boating nature of the early apostles. Harp and horns, right out of the Psalms. And that's an open Bible. If this were at the library, we might think it's a dictionary, but it's not. It's a church, so we think open Bible. The, the paperwork, the, the correspondence between the church, the congregation, and Pittsburgh Stained Glass. Pittsburgh Stained Glass came back and said, okay, we're going to do these six Christian symbol windows. And this is what they're going <clears> to <throat> have. And they only had like a phrase. Um, but they also gave them these names. And I, I put that up there because I think it's interesting. I would not give these names to these windows. The window of faith, cross and crown, window of prayer. I should have written ascending dove. I noticed that too late. Window of teaching, Ten Commandments. Window of hope, anchor. Window of praise, I get that. Harp and trumpets. The window of charity, an open Bible. I don't know. But it's hard to... Uh, argue with that those symbols are for call to mind things very important very much at the basis of our faith comments questions I can really see charity being God's word God is love opened up to us okay What, what do you say, you know? <laughs> the other, another thing that goes on is that Leslie Shuttleworth is changing periodically. We have different colors of the draperies, the cloths over the communion table, over the pulpit, the colors of the banners. <clears throat> it's linked to a traditional liturgical year. A full liturgical year for it. A Catholic or for an Episcopalian would have a lot more things on it. But these are the basics that they've got. It starts with Advent, goes to Christmas. There are some Sundays between Christmas tide ends at Epiphany in January. And then we have a bunch of Sundays. Then we have Lent, and that would last through Palm Sunday. Then there's Holy Week, Black Easter. Easter tide is the Sundays between Easter and Pentecost. Pentecost is red. So you notice it's not just random when we have red or green or purple or white. It's very intentional. I've never seen black, although we do put, she does put black draperies over the, cloth, over the cross in, in, on Holy Week. The red of Pentecost is also used for Reformation Sunday, which is obviously not celebrated by Catholic Church. <laughs> And um, it's also for ordination of clergy. It was up the day that uh, Nate was installed here as senior pastor. And it's also for funeral services of ordained clergy. Now, the green is for ordinary time, which is all the times when it's not purple or white or red. And it doesn't mean that it's ordinary in commonplace. It means it's ordinary as in first, second, third, those ordinal word ordinal is where we get the ordinary. And if you look in the, the books, it'll talk about the third Sunday, third Sunday of ordinary time, the fifth Sunday, the 18th Sunday of ordinary time. Um, and that's all green. I've been trying to take pictures of this. Um, can't get, but with a pandemic, and I've not been in the sanctuary, don't always have pictures. 
But we do have purple. This was up um, in Lent. We'll come back to the IHS. Green for ordinary time. They put symbols on this stuff. And again, grapes and wheat, Last Supper, <clears throat> or loaves and fishes, also green. There, there's no rule about what kind of symbol you put on this. I mean, but Christian artists have decided. There's more red for Pentecost. And if you look, you can see on the communion table where it's not covered by the red, there's an IHS. We'll come back to that. And Cairo, we'll come back to some Greek letters too. But you see the cross and the crown on that little cloth under the Bible. Crown of thorns. Pentecost, flames on their heads. Dove descending, again, Pentecost. There are, um, not again part of stained glass, but part of Christian symbolism. And I wouldn't have included this except uh, several months ago, a good friend of mine uh, organized a bunch of us to go to St. Nicholas Catholic Church in Millvale. It's the church where a Croatian artist has murals all over the walls. It's beautiful. Get a chance to go, go. Uh, they have, um, the people who are interested in preserving that Croatian immigrant heritage are not necessarily people from the church. They're interested in the immigrant experience and the art, rightly so. And they've got a separate organization from the church. They work together with the church. Their work, obviously, the preservation of the, of the murals and education along with them. Obviously, the church has first say on what's going on. So we, our tour had to get out of there quickly because there was going to be a wedding coming on shortly. But the um, young woman who was giving our group its little tour obviously had no idea about Christian symbolism. And where do you start? You know, I, I just didn't say anything. So INRI is on top of the cross on the wall there at St. Nicholas Church in Millville. And she says, oh, that's the artist's childhood name. So he signed the, <laughs> he signed his work. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, if, let it go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Enri, it's an initials, there's no J in Latin. Latin students talk about Julius Caesar, because they don't say Julius Caesar. And it becomes Jesus Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Rex being Latin for king. I mean, you got to know this stuff. I mean, and I debated for a week. Should I send her a note? No, let it go. Let somebody else fight that battle. We see IHS all over the place. Iota, Eta, and Sigma in the Greek alphabet. And Eta is really an H. It's not an E. So I think it's probably Yeshua, when we hear Jesus, not called Jesus, but Yeshua, a different variant in the name. It's the first three letters of the word for Jesus. So if you see this, you would know. And this C is, I cannot figure it out. Basically, it's a different way of writing an S in a cursive form, in a capital, lowercase, whatever. If the Greeks were happy with the C being there, fine. A sigma looks like the E, and that's where the S would be. So it's iota, for, the I for iota, the H for eta, and the S for sigma. I used to think this meant in this sign, in hoc signo, which is Latin for in this sign. Going back to Constantine, where he had the vision, in this sign you will conquer, he put the cross <clears throat> on the flags as he went into battle the next day, and he won. And it changed history forever because Christianity became an approved religion in the Roman Empire. And after that, it became the official religion. But I thought, OK, they're, they're remembering Constantine. No, they're thinking of Jesus, not Constantine, when they write this. 
And a few years ago, Jack and I were having some major, major work done at our house. And the contractor started bringing all his stuff that he was going to need. He needed everything. And he just dumped all his tools at our house. Fine. Big stuff. And it all had IHS on it. And I had this idea, but I said, what is IHS? And it did mean in his service. And I like that. I mean, all his tools in his service, regardless of what his workmen, his crew, that's what he was all about. Well, he got about 80% of the way into the job and went bankrupt. And he left all this stuff at our house, and he never came back to pick it up. So for years, I enjoyed when we would mulch our yard, our wheelbarrow in his service. We mucking out our garage and our shop back says in his service. And I think that's probably theologically right. We should do, all, do everything in his service, even mucking out the garage. Short, short order, um, his bankruptcy was a, a blip, not a big blip, but it all worked out in the end. And we got all this equipment. Do we still have any of it? A few things. Do you think in his service when you're doing it? No. You know, <laughs> Jack thinks of him going bankrupt, not him doing it in his service. Not finishing the job. It was interesting a few days there, but it all worked. It, it all came out. It means Jesus, IHS. It's on a number of those things. The X and the P. X is the Greek chi. P is the Greek rho. First two letters of Christos. We'll go back and look at some of those other symbols in a minute and see where these are used. The fish, the big deal. Uh, that ichthus is the Greek word for fish. And under that are the letters that make up ichthus. If you, if you can read Greek, you would, oh yeah, ichthus. Iota, chi, theta, upsilon, sigma. And it becomes an anagram. Iota means Jesus. Chi means Christus, theta, God. Upsilon, first letter of sun, again, all in Greek, sigma, savior. So the fish, although it's a really easy symbol to put on your wall, and other people might think you just like salmon, but in a Christian's home, it means something very different and becomes part of a secret language. Jesus, anointed, God, son, savior. Let's go backwards here. OK, there's the IHS with the cross. The chi and the rho. Yeah, I guess that's the only one we've got. Questions on all that? Might say something to Leslie Shuttleworth. She keeps track of it. Good for her. This class is called the Gospel in Glass, so it should include all the windows. These are the clerestory windows, which are way up high along the ceiling line, original to the, the original part of the building. There are six of them, and there's a lot of white in these, which is fair. They want a lot of light to come into the sanctuary. Being up high like that, that light is not going to be in your eyes like it would be if it were down low on one of the aisle windows. I have tried to find symbolism in here, and I could probably make up a lot of stuff, and it would probably sound really good. But in the end, I would be making it up. There's just nothing distracting, and they're beautiful. Clear Street is it's an architectural term. It means the part of a wall that is above a roof. That side aisle has a roof over it. And this goes up, and if you were to look out of those, if you were to fall out of one of the clear streets, you'd land on the roof over the side aisle. Clear street simply means that kind of wall over a roof. Then there are the um, windows in the vestibules. When the church was originally built, people would have come through these Washington Road doors. I mean, if you would come through those other windows the other doors into the sanctuary, you would have had to come through the pastor's study or the choir room. They really were not 
entries for the general public. So you would come in those either side, and on each side there's um, two of the, two pairs like this. Again, no symbolism that I can see. I can make up a lot, um, but it would sort of get you in the mood. There's a mistake here. And I like that there's a mistake. I like the whimsy that it's in the vestibule. And I think it's an intentional mistake because they did not do it anywhere else. They did it in the vestibule where it's not distracting. If I saw a mistake in the glass in the sanctuary, I'd spend my life looking for another mistake. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. The red. The red. The red. Yeah. yeah, the red and green. There's another window um, where there are three red petals and one green. So obviously they had the right pieces of glass. They just fixed them up. Do you think that's for all to represent synapse coming in? Right there. Yeah. Pardon? So that represents synapse coming in? I don't think it represents. <laughs> Maybe it does. I think it's just whimsy. But it could represent sinners coming in. It, um, I went upstairs. I think this, the panel, I think this is on this side. There's a panel that matches this with the opposite mistake. Take a look. And I went over here to look, and I don't think there's the same whimsical thing over there. I call it Where's Waldo? The newest stained glass. This is from the 2004. But it actually starts earlier than that when in Rick's early days in his pastorate, came up with gathered and scattered. And there was a lot said, a lot thought. That's the kind of thing that this church was about, gathering the people, scattering the people. There was a family at, here at the church at that time named Tesmer. A lot of you would probably remember Laurel Tesmer, Ed Tesmer. They had uh, two daughters, Connie and Lavender. Connie Webb is still here, but um, at the time she was in high school. And Ed was a really accomplished, imaginative commercial artist working in advertising. And he sat down and he was the one who came up with that stalk of wheat with some of the seeds on the stalk and some scattered. When I first saw it, I thought, well, yeah, but nobody else thought of it. Now you see it and you think, Sure, gathered and scattered. Well, come up to about 2003, 2004, I'm not sure who had the idea, but this window is the combined work of Rick, H.B. Mertz, and his crew over at Renaissance Glassworks, and Jason Walling, Carpentry and all that. I like that we come in, we're gathered, we go out, we're scattered. And again, it's so simple. But it's not about farming at all. It's about the people of God. There's um, some website explanation about this. The wheat represents Beverly Heights as bread, life, and the body of Jesus Christ. The stalk represents Beverly Heights in its gathered dimension. Individuals coming together comprising the whole living as one. It's so simple. It's so obvious. The field represents the world in which Beverly Heights and its members live, bringing the kingdom of God near. And the seed represents Beverly Heights in its scattered dimension, individual members living as light, salt, and leaven where God has planted them. Comments? Yeah. <laughs> it's simple. Um, I've had a couple comments. Christian symbolism is a weird thing to be interested in. And somebody said, how did you get interested in this? So this next is, is personal. And it comes from when I was a kid. I grew up in Orville, Ohio, which is about three hours from here. It's the home of Smucker's Jelly. It, um, it's in some of the best farmland ever in Ohio. It's about 10 miles from Worcester, half hour from Akron, uh, about an hour and 10 minutes from Cleveland. It was a nice little village to grow up in. There were about seven, six, 7,000 people. The Presbyterian Church had been built in 1871, and this is one of the original windows. 
in about 1960, the church wanted to, wanted to grow, and it was not going to happen on that lot, which was way too small. They bought some land on the side of, this, of the little town and built another church. Event, they sold the old church to the Church of the Nazarene, who wor worshipped there for years. And I'm not sure what happened after that, but eventually the library across the street bought the church, tore it down, and made a parking lot. But they rescued one of the windows, and this is hanging in the front of the library. So that's the kind of stained glass I grew up with when I was a really little kid. Now, this next one, I apologize for the quality of the picture. Um, who knew it was going to be a PowerPoint decades later? This is the church they put up. It sort of resembles Westminster Church or Bower Hill, that red brick, a lot of white woodwork, um, this big white steeple. There's no room here for stained glass. The glass was translucent, uh, very imperfect glass. You could not see out. It was not quite what we would call glass block, not that kind, but nice translucent, letting the light in, but not glaring and n not distracting you. We're not watching the butterflies outside. But on the back wall, under that steeple, it's hard to see, there's uh, cast concrete symbols. And I was a little kid, and I thought this was just the most miraculous thing I'd ever heard, that you could do this. I mean, I knew about the obvious signs of the manger or the cross. I knew that. But this was different. And they put them right on the side of the church facing the town. There were four, four symbols. Now this one, the butterfly is on the, the utmost, the top, symbolizes the resurrection. The, cro the cup and, and the cross below that, passion, and um, Last Supper. The shell, scallop shell, baptism in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and the rose would be from Christmas. Lo, how a rose air blooming. They're not quite so obvious symbols, and I was just blown away that this kind of thing could be. There were a couple books flying around, and it turns out a little kid can read an adult book if it's about Christian symbols, because there's the picture, there's the paragraph, and you can do that. And you don't have to read the whole book like your parents might read the book front to back. Just thumb through, that's a symbol I'm interested in, and there it is. I got interested not to do anything with, and I'm certainly no artist, but I've enjoyed ever since going through churches and seeing, just what are they doing? What's the artist doing? What kinds of things do they want to call to mind? So who knew? that decades later, I'd still be doing this kind of stuff. Scrawny little kid grew up. Comments? Questions? Impressions? I've always looked at the aisle windows with the uh, thinking of the Rose of Sharon. And that, that looks like that, but they're calling it the Rose of Christmas. But uh, they're everywhere. The, the, Could the, be. And I, that's what I think of, the Rose of Sharon. It may not be. It's nice. It calls it to mind, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. But you don't really get hung up. No, no. Thank and, you. and really, when you look at the windows, they aren't exactly alike. There's different pieces of glass all over the place. You know, yes. Especially the side pieces of the sequence. But, uh, <laughs> you can see where you know, they put green here, they put white. On the, and the next one is supposed to look like it, but they're not exactly the same. It's so the same thing, yeah. yeah. Just very peaceful. Very calming. Anything else? Good. Bob, can I ask you to close some prayer? Yeah.